Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of Break It All Down, where I also cross over my subject matter with that of the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. Why is that? Because I'm reviewing Console Wars by Blake J. Harris. I figured I'd give this book a check out, partially because, one, it recently came out, and the author was at Port Retro Gaming Expo. Two, because if you've been watching the Nintendo Power Retrospectives, you know that I'm approaching the, well, if you've been watching my show and you also know a little bit about video game history, you know that I'm approaching the launch of the Super Nintendo, and we are get and the console wars are about to get into full swing. At this point, the Genesis has been out, but Nintendo hasn't really been doing much Nintendo Power to acknowledge the fact that there are other game systems out there. Um, the most we've gotten is some passive mention of the PC, of the PC, but that's pretty much it. So, I decided to, you know, read the console wars, this book, and check it out. It's it's a very substantial book. And when I saw the page count, when I looked it up on Goodreads, I thought, oh, this is going to be the most, like, super comprehensive book to ever be published on the console wars. I'm going to get in-depth in every aspect of it. And I'm sadly mistaken. I was sadly mistaken. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is an interesting book and an exhaustively researched book, but the way it presents its, its historical narrative is flawed. And, well, let's talk about historical narrative in, in nonfiction. When it comes to non nonfiction, particularly books focusing on the history of something, um, there tends to be a focus on trying to put a narrative together. The, by looking at an event, or a person, or what have you, and focusing on causes and effects. What caused this event to happen? What caused this person to become the person they became? Um, and the effects. What effects did this event have on history? What effects did this person have on history? When it comes to a chain of events like this, it's more a series of causes and effects. How did each event build into each other? And that sort of thing. Um... So that's when you read a, hist a non-fiction history book. That's the, the way the narrative's presented. Um, this is kind of like that, but it also tells its narrative as a narrative, as a fictional narrative, as a prose narrative. And this causes problems which makes the console wars less effective as a historical book. Um, it picks out point of view characters and tells things through their perspective and the problem I have is because there are no references at the back of the book there is no um, nothing to say okay what were my sources on these various conversations it may it makes a lot of the stuff we get in this book that isn't directly from a the perspective of a point of view character hearsay. It's something that somebody told to someone else, in this case Tom Kalinske, who was for a long time the president of Sega of America. It's something somebody told Tom Kalinske, who then told the writer. If you've ever played Telephone, you can see the problem with that. Even if Tom Kalinske, when he is talking to Blake J. Harris, even if Tom Kalinske is coming into this with no ulterior motive, he wasn't trying to make himself look like a million bucks. He wasn't trying to make the guy who came before him at Sega look bad. He wasn't trying to make any any decisions made at Sega after his departure look negative, and that if they if he, they'd kept him or if they listened to him, things would have gone better. If assuming he had no ulterior motive, he was not trying to slander or slime anyone. You still have the risks of we're going off of one guy's flawed memory. Now, in the book, in the prologues and stuff, Harris says, oh, I've done all this extensive research and that sort of thing. So, arguably, that, arguably, there's, some of these conversations have been 
the the content of them has been fact checked against the other participants, but that's not how it's presented in the book. And I don't. And because we have no references, we have no reference chapter. I have no way to tell which conversations have been fact checked and which one haven't. Additionally. Because of how the book is presented, because it's presented as a prose narrative as opposed to the narrative of something like a nonfiction, of a more traditional nonfiction book, like, for example, David Kushner's excellent Masters of Doom, um, because of that, it hurts the text of the, it hurts, it hurts the text of the book, just in general. Um, I'll just put it in plain, straightforward, plain as possible. This is Masters of Doom. This, oh, no, sorry, this is the Console Wars. This is Masters of Doom. I realize the vertical and horizontal dimensions of the page for the Console Wars are smaller than Masters of Doom, but the point is, it is a book which could have been more concise. And, or, if they kept it the same length and used a more traditional non-fiction way of presenting this information, could have presented all this... a lot more information about the console war between Sega and Nintendo uh, from more perspectives. As it is, the book focuses entirely, almost entirely, on the console wars from a sort of marketing standpoint, from a corporate management and marketing standpoint. Which is, an, which is a different perspective from, from what we normally get. Normally, for works like Masters of Doom, we focus on the designer side of things. The people who build the console hardware. The game designers. The people, who, the coders who write the games. Um, and because of this, we do get some interesting viewpoints that we, I hadn't seen before. A good example here is, around the book, we talk about um, Harris and Kalinske talk about the classic ad campaign... Genesis does what Nintendo don't. It's one of the most iconic ad campaigns of the console wars. It's one that has been remembered for years, and by the standards of ad campaigns, by th in theory, it should be a success. It's memorable. It stood the test of time. It says basically everything what, the, what, Nintendo, what Sega is trying to say. Sega Genesis, a 16-bit system, is more powerful, um, has more processing power, has more color processing capabilities, is a more advanced system than the Nintendo Entertainment System. Genesis does, but Nintendo don't. What the book puts forward is that that ad campaign is a failure. And at first glance, you say, why is it a failure? I know what this ad campaign is. I remember it in some cases fondly. And the, the thing before it is, at the time the ad campaign came out, Sega, the Sega Genesis was not being stocked in any of the major retail chains. Couldn't go to Target, couldn't go to Kmart, or Walmart, um, Sears, and pick up a Genesis. And consequently, the ad campaign is was, in the eyes of Sega management, a failure because it may have made customers want to go out and buy a system, but if they can't actually go out and buy them, you're fa it's, it's still a failure. Even if you have customers clamoring at stores saying, please order this thing, if the executives don't feel that they can make their money by selling the system, it's not worth it. Particularly because at the time, also, this is before the Nintendo sort of antitrust suit. This is the one that led to the infamous $5 coupon, where every purchaser of Nintendo Entertainment System would receive a $5 voucher for any Nintendo product. Of course, if you're familiar with how much those things cost at the time, you couldn't actually buy a Nintendo product for $5, so all it really did was give money to Nintendo. Um... And Nintendo was pressuring retailers, and like, if a retailer wanted to send games back or do a markdown on Nintendo systems because they felt because these sales were slacking off, and Nintendo wouldn't let them do it, 
And if the retailer did it anyway, Nintendo would um, reduce shipments to the retailer or withhold shipments entirely. This falls in the category of antitrust. Um, Private led to the suit. But in any case, this is a problem for Sega and to a certain degree limits the ad campaigns because you want, if you want your console to succeed and be a comparable rival to Nintendo, you gotta get in, in stores. Um, so on the one hand, the book gets into that, does a good job getting into that. On the other hand, because it limits its perspective, nar its narrative perspective to Tom Kalinske and people in his circle, in the upper management at Sega, this means there's a lot of voices, which are important voices, that get shut out. Not just for, not just from a design standpoint, the standpoint we've gotten before, but from also the management and marketing and publication standpoint, the, the business standpoint. And that's the third party publishers. The book sets up early on that game consoles live and die by the third party publishers. And the reason Sega did poorly with the Master System is because, well, Nintendo had them locked down. Had the publishers, the third party publishers, the ones who were important, the ones who mattered, the ones who had name recognition locked down. The Capcoms, the Konamis, Squares. Sorry if I'm smacking my lips. Um, the third party publishers weren't on Sega's system. They were locked down with Nintendo. And what the book doesn't get into is how Nintendo lured the third party publishers in. I mean, as an example, if you're familiar with the Genesis console library, one of the launch games was a Sega made port of Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts. So the question becomes, well, how did this come to pass? This is a situation where Capcom wanted to put the game uh, on the Genesis, but because of contracts they weren't able to, or was, Gen was Sega coming and knocking on Capcom's door saying, hey, if you can't do the port yourselves, we'll do it, we'll license it from you. That's a, from a sort of historical standpoint, an interesting question to find out the answer to. To find out how on board, from a publication standpoint, and from a development standpoint, were the third parties. Were, the, were they having to be persuaded to come in, uh, particularly once Nintendo's restrictions laxed? Or were, once those restrictions were gone, they were like, great, we'll come right in to the Genesis. We want to be on this system. We want to make games for this system. We wanted to do it for a long time, and now we're finally able to. That question's never really answered very well. Additionally, the book does some weird things for trying to foreshadow stuff. In particular, the congressional hearings that led to the formation of the ESRB. The ones about Night Trap, where you have Joe Lieberman claiming that the game has you putting co-eds on meat hooks, that sort of thing. Uh, comparing it to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And the thing is, it, it, it foreshadows this in a way which is kind of dumb and kind of insulting to the audience. Um, because this book's audience is very much people like me. People who are interested in the history of the video game industry and want to learn more. And God's going to people who play games. And the game sets up like Street Fighter and Castlevania as foreshadowing of the dark and sinister of the, of the of the more violent and gritty games that are coming ahead and how they are laying and how Street Fighter lays the groundwork for the for these to the moral panic but it, it sets this up in a way where it's like people are where like Kalinsky and all these publishers are worried about Street Fighter and what this what this indicates for the future of the industry and it's a weird way to take it because it's 
It's like telling people, oh, this thing you like is going to get us all into trouble. Or this, this thing you like, it's th this relatively tame thing you like, and this thing which didn't actually cause much controversy in the first place, Street Fighter, Castlevania, is going to lead, is going to bring us to, to horrible moral panics. Which is weird. I'd be more inclined to a certain degree to I mean, if we had more of a development, if we focus more on the developer side of things, um, we could get, we could probably got a more interesting narrative around it that didn't feel weirdly condescending, um, in terms of the restrictive content policies on Nintendo versus the more lax or loose policies on Sega. Developers going to push, putting the games more on Sega systems because they felt they could have more artistic freedom, or perhaps they were sort of the game de game development equivalent of the exploitation film develop directors of the 60s or 60s and 70s. Uh, like, oh, we can get away with more period content on this system, and we can't do that in Nintendo, so our games will sell more on this system. Or something like that. Just having getting more into that from the mindset of the decisions being made by developers and publishers in terms of what content was or was not going to be put in their games. Um, but we don't. So, when it comes down to it, is Console Wars a book I would wholeheartedly recommend? No. Would I recommend it with reservations? Yes. This is a book which which presents a perspective of the console wars which hasn't really been told very well. We occasionally have gotten snippets about the conflicts between Sega of America um, and Sega of Japan, particularly their management. Little bits and pieces that slipped out in the past. This book kind of goes into that. Not kind of. It really does go into that into more depth than any other book about the console wars or the history of gaming has done in the past. Um, but on its own, outside of the contents, context of bigger books like The Ultimate History of Video Games, uh, Game Over, uh, Replay, books with kind of a more holistic view of the history of gaming and how the industry evolved as a whole, it's not worth it. Just to go, okay, this is the one book that you need to get on the console wars. It's too focused on one company. In fact, actually, Game Over has a similar problem. It focuses too heavily on Nintendo and sort of derides, mocks, and degrades Sega in the process. So, neither one is really great on their own as far as Game Over or the console wars. I'd really recommend getting the ultimate history of video games if you want to get started reading into this field. And then, if the industry side of things is something you're actually in interested in, um, as opposed to just focused on the developer side of things, the how the games are made, and more interested more in how the games are sold, and how the games and systems are sold, console wars could be of interest to you but only kind of in that specific context. So, this episode should be going out on the 31st, so I'd like to wish you all a Happy New Year. I failed to wish you a Merry Christmas in my last video, so I'd like to wish you a, a after-the-fact Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah, and I don't know what the appropriate adjective is for Kwanzaa, so I'll just do Happy Kwanzaa as well. And, well, again, wish you and yours a Happy New Year. And I will see you next time.